When we talked about uh, what we would do this year for uh, our, our, our entertainment and our presentation, we talked about the fact that we all went want to be looking into the future and many of us have already taken some significant steps into the future both in terms of the modes of our operation, the styles of our operation, and the ways in which we use equipment, some of the new equipment that is available to us as amateur radio operators. So we wanted the focus to be toward the future. And several people commented at the time, well, the, the future is, as far as our hobby, equipment-wise, and in terms of the modes in which we use, the future is really digital. And we need some organization, individual, who has provided for us a, a, a pathway, an entrance into that future. We talked about the future begins here, because that's literally true. We take the future out the door with us tonight when we walk away from this event or from this convention this weekend. So it's my pleasure now to introduce to you the Vice President for Engineering at Flex Radio Systems. He has uh, agreed to come and uh, he offered four hours of program and I told Steve we'd, we'd, we'd go for 40 minutes. So uh, we, we, we've uh, got Steve ahead of us for, the, for those 40 minutes. Steve, it's yours. All right, thank you, Everett. Let's see if this will work. Can we use this one here? Hello, hello. One, one, one? No. Okay, I'll hold the mic. Uh, thanks a lot, Everett, and I'd like to thank Everett and Delvin and everybody uh, with the CPAC uh, convention. Uh, this is a great show. We always enjoy coming out here. Uh, sitting up here at the table, I got to talking to Everett earlier, and I said how magnificent the weather was, and he assures me that all 365 days a year are just like this. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to move out here next year probably, but that's not true. Bye-bye, Texas. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I want to tell you a little bit about me first so you know uh, kind of what my interests are and where I'm coming from. Um, I really like to do uh, microwave roving. That's my fun thing in the hobby. And as a ham, you have not lived until you've driven a vehicle like this with a high school kid in it to drop them off at high school and listen to the objections of that. So this is a great joy of my life being able to do that. Here's another picture of my rover uh, on the side of the road on a Texas dirt highway uh, trying to work somebody back up in Dallas from several hundred miles away. So what I'm going to do tonight is talk a little bit about, uh, take a little stroll through history and uh, some of the technology things that we've seen uh, change in ham radio and then uh, talk about what I think some of the future things are and these are going to be from my perspective and I'm probably going to leave a lot of things out and you're going to scratch your head and say we well, didn't talk about X or he didn't talk about Y and amateur radio is a very diverse hobby and there's a lot of things I'm going to miss but I'm going to talk about the ones I think are, are of, of real interest. So if you look back in the hobby uh, we had uh, lots of radios like uh, this is a Collins S line and we've moved into a lot of SDRs now. Many of us have SDRs. How many people in the audience have an SDR radio. A lot of people do. So uh, I hear uh, very often people say, hey, this is the future of our hobby and this is what we're going to be doing. And so I want to explore uh, what we might be doing after that and how this might evolve uh, as we move forward. So when I got to thinking about this, I said, really, what are the drivers of change and what might uh, influence where we move uh, forward in ham radio? And uh, I came up with four key things I wanted to talk about. Uh, one is population and demographics and how the hobby's changing. Uh, the second is the legal environment. Uh, one of the things they told me in business school is one of the things that creates and destroys businesses faster than anything is the legal environment. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, talk about culture shift and how culture changes can affect ham radio. And then lastly, technology and I left it for last because I'm an engineer, hey, and it's my favorite part and I want to spend some time talking about it. So one of the things uh, that I did when I got started is I went and looked at what the amateur radio population did and uh, AH0A had some uh, historical data here for the last I think this is 25 years, maybe 30 years, uh, of what's happened to the amateur radio population over time here in the U.S. And you can see it took a dip there uh, from 2003 to roughly 2007, and then we got the no-code uh, tech license, and then all of a sudden things took off and have been growing ever since. And they're growing at the rate roughly of 1.1% per year, which is not a huge rate, but they are growing. And I do hear on a regular basis people come by and say, hey, you know, ham radio is a dying hobby and that sort of thing, but it's really not. It is a growing hobby. And I want to show you kind of what's happening with the licenses so you see it's not just technicians. So this is the extra class, and you can see the extra class picked up when no code happened. This is the general class. Same thing here. There's a big jump, and then it's continued up. 
And then of course the technician class has this huge climb as well. So all of the licenses across the board are growing and the hobby is growing. So here again is the picture. As I said, it's growing uh, at roughly 1.1% uh, compound annual growth rate. And uh, uh, this trajectory can be changed over time based on any of the things that we talk about tonight or, or maybe some things I didn't talk about. So th this is something that I, I get asked a lot uh, as an amateur radio vendor is, uh, you know, is everyone in the hobby going to die and there won't be any more and that's the deal. Well, yes, eventually we'll all die at some point, uh, but uh, there's really no data here that says that this is going to be the end of the hobby. We have lots of new people here. We had a lot of new people walk into our booth today and look at new equipment and that sort of thing. So. Um, the common model with most amateurs is that they see something when they're young and they, they develop a passion for amateur radio. Maybe it's they walked into somebody's shack and they flipped the lights on and they saw the ham radio gear whirl up and they saw all that stuff and they thought about that and they said, I'm going to do that someday. And then life happens, right? We end, up, we end up raising kids, getting married, having a family, and then later in life the hobby blossoms and we all spend more time doing it. So this is a real common environment for all of us to be in. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit, move on, talk about the legal environment uh, and what happens here uh, that could affect ham radio. Uh, we could add or lose bands to the am amateur radio privileges, and this has happened over time. I'll talk a little bit about that. The license classes that we have could change. As I mentioned, the no-code license did uh, cause an influx of hams, and changes to that could also do the same thing. And then uh, legal requirements also can change over time. So. Let's talk a little bit about the addition and losses of ham radio bands. So we had in uh, 2012 new allocations on 60 meters. Uh, we've recently had a 2200 and 630 meter band get added uh, uh, last year in 2017. How many people are active on these two bands? Not very many. So you have two new bands to go out there and explore. We always have use concerns about the microwave bands, 2.3, 3.4, and 5.7 gig because these are highly sought after bands by telecommunication companies and if we don't use these bands, uh, they could be taken away from us. But after looking at all these, I don't think any of these are very likely to go change our population if any of them happen. And uh, I don't see anything on the horizon from a band chain standpoint that's likely really to change the future of the hobby, although some things could happen here. Uh, as I mentioned, the no-code uh, change in uh, licensing uh, did cause a big trajectory change for us. And the interesting thing about this was there are a lot of uh, people that didn't feel like this should happen, but it did change the, the uh, hobby for the better, and it also rejuvenated interest in CW. Now it wasn't a, you have to do CW, it was, so it was a point of pride. Well, I, I have my license, but I also know CW. I didn't have to learn it, but I wanted to go do that to be able to communicate. And there was some resentment. I remember initially after this change happened, there were people that said, well, you know, I got my license. I had to do 20 words a minute or 13 words a minute or whatever. And there was concern about people that didn't earn it. But I don't hear that anymore. So what could happen here in the legal environment with respect to changes in licenses that, that might uh, alter the hobby at all? Well, I got to thinking about this and I said, you know, what, what are some of the things that could happen that might spur the hobby and, and give us some more life? Uh, one of them was, I said, what if we uh, gave anyone that's uh, degreed in engineering or let's say the physical sciences the opportunity to apply for a license and, and call it a new class? Let's call it a science class license and maybe they get special call signs. And those people don't have to go through all of the testing that we have to go through because they have some of the background in the sciences involved already. And you could even take that further and say uh, students that have passed an AP physics test or something like that in high school could do the same thing. Would that bring new lifeblood into the hobby? Would there be complaints that those people didn't earn the license like the rest of us did? Do we think that they would be good stewards of the hobby like we have been? And what would happen to amateur radio? So that's an interesting thing and I think if, uh, if we look at some of those things, if the hobby trajectory changes in a different direction that are worth talking about. The next thing I looked at was uh, how culture shifts affect uh, how different things are perceived. And um, I know when I talk to people that don't know ham radio, I say, I'm a ham radio operator because it comes out in conversation. I get all kinds of different reactions. Some of those are, you know, I thought that was an old hobby and do you still use tubes and, you know, all those kinds of questions. I'm sure all of you have heard this. And so those changes can be, those perceptions in, in our hobby can be changed through movies, TV, books. Uh, news reports, those kind of things that talk about our hobby. 
What if there was a blockbuster movie that featured ham radio in a positive way and made people say, that's something that I want to do? How would that change our hobby? There have been a lot of culture shifts uh, through time and I want to look at a few of them that happened here uh, in the past 10 years, 20 years that have affected not only ham radio but our life in general. <clears throat> The advent of the internet and the constant connectivity that we all have. I know there were some people that felt like uh, the addition of the internet and the ability to pick up a phone and call anybody anywhere in the world would be the death of ham radio. And it really hasn't been. Uh, the advent of free information. You can literally pick up your phone or your computer and find out anything that you want to find out looking online very quickly. Uh, there's a lot of diversity changes in the United States. Uh, we have, I live in Texas, you guys live on the West Coast, and so you can see there's a lot of changes in the population and what's happening. We've become an instant gratification culture. You can go to Amazon and order anything you want and have it delivered tomorrow, or if not then, within the next week. There's been a change in uh, how we dress. Uh, how many of you remember going to work with a shirt and tie and slacks or maybe even a coat? How many of you did that in your career? Well, it's not like that anymore. For most companies, you dress, uh, you dress down. I wear jeans to work every day, and a lot of people are like that. Everyone now is a photographer, right? Everybody has a cell phone or something they can take pictures with and fancy themselves of, as a photographer. And so photography is an interesting hobby, and how many of you also share this hobby, the hobby of photography? There's a lot of crossover between photography and ham radio. So I wanted to talk about it because it has seen a downturn. If you look at the number of cameras shipped uh, that have changed uh, over the years, they continue to go down. This is an infographic and I'm sure it's hard to see, uh, but the left hand uh, little bar chart there shows that it's gone down and there's been a 35% drop in camera shipped in 2016 over the year before. So what has fueled this? Well, the most common thing is the cell phone, that everybody feels like they can pick up a cell phone and take a picture and, you know, hey, those pictures are good enough now. It used to be that if you didn't have a DSLR or a nice film camera, you couldn't take good pictures. So uh, I flew in earlier um, this week with my family and we went down to Crater Lake and I snapped this shot with my cell phone. And I can go compare it against a shot that I took 10 years ago with my DSLR. This camera has 12 megapixels. My first DSLR had 3.3 megapixels. And this is a better picture. And I took it on my cell phone. So for many of us, a cell phone is now good enough. Uh, there are certainly professionals that still use uh, semi-pro, you know, semi-pro folks that use DSLRs. I walked around here today and I saw a lot of those. Uh, I have a DSLR, a digital uh, single lens reflex camera, and I still use it some, but I don't carry it often. And I haven't bought a new DSLR in years. So these are my three kids that I brought with me on uh, vacation. And uh, it was kind of funny as we got to doing stuff, I saw them pull out cameras and I thought, you know, what's going on here? And so I had them line up all their cameras on the table to look at them. And this is really interesting to me for a, a reason. My son brought a, uh, a small digital camera, uh, or he bought a cell phone, he bought a film camera, but he also bought a disposable 35 millimeter camera, you know, the kind you buy at Walmart and you rip open the package and take some shots and go have them developed. Uh, my middle daughter has a DSLR she brought. She also bought an instant film camera and the white camera there is a Polaroid knockoff. You take a picture with it, it whirs and out comes a little teeny photograph that's about four inches tall by two inches wide. I've yet to really see one out of that camera I'm impressed with. But yet the kids love them. They love to have those pictures and they'll take them and stick them in the back of their phone case and carry them around to remember important events. And she has a uh, cell phone as well. And my youngest daughter has one of those cameras. She also has a DSLR and she carried around a disposable camera. So they have all these different cameras. Well, this is real similar to ham radio, right? How many people have both a new rig and an old rig, <laughs> right? You've got your Drake and you've got your Flex or whatever else. And each one of these brings you different pleasures, right? So, but photography's had this big roll off and why hasn't this happened to AM radio? Well, I think one of the fundamental differences is that the purpose of ham radio is not to send a message. Most of you do not get on the air every day to send a message to somebody. You get on there because you enjoy talking to people. Uh, maybe you're DXing and you want to collect extra countries. You're a contester and you enjoy the thrill of doing that. Uh, if you are having to uh, provide communications for a storm or something like that, yes, your purpose may be deliver communication and you might be using 
using ham radio because your cell phone doesn't work. But for the most part, ham radio is not all about delivering communications. Whereas I think photography largely is about the end product. It is about producing a beautiful picture. As I said, it's a multi multifaceted, exciting hobby that explores and exploits physical phenomena. I, one of the reasons I do ham radio is because I'm very fascinated by uh, propagation modes and what happens to the signal once you've transmitted it and where it's going to go and where it ends up and who can hear it and who can't. And you really can't test that any other way without transmitting. So amateur radio is uh, unique and it's pursued for very many reasons. It's not just because we're there to communicate. So I want to talk now a little bit about technology and this is uh, the bulk of what I'm going to talk about is what are some of the technological changes that have impacted our hobby and how have they impacted it and where is the future likely to take them. So the real question here is how can new technology affect amateur radio and how has it done so in the past and what are the likely trends that are going to affect us in the future. So there's a number of technology trends that are still in progress and I mentioned some of these. Uh, the internet. Uh, although the internet is everywhere and it's practically ubiquitous, there's still a lot of things that are happening here. Uh, you can't get free internet everywhere you go. Sometimes you have to pay for it. And it's not always available everywhere. I know when I uh, drove from Crater Lake up here, you can't get internet at Crater Lake. So there's things you can't do. Um, computing power uh, has really spurred on digital modes and all the things you can do with that in software-defined radio. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Software-defined radio itself is a huge part of the hobby and growing. There's a big emphasis now on battery technology and miniaturization. I'll show you some pictures of things that have happened uh, there and how that's continuing to happen and show you some of the likely technology trends out of that. So if we look at the internet, uh, what do we use the internet for as ham radio operators? Well, there's just millions of things, right? Just to name a few, uh, you use it to go set the clock on your WSJT so you can work FT8. Right? Yeah, you look up QRZ records for DX contacts that you have. So you might be talking to somebody on the air and you hear his call sign, you type him in, you look up and you get a picture of his shack. That's a nice thing to do. Uh, you can participate in real-time contest scoring. How many contesters do we have in here? Okay, and how many of you do real-time contest scoring? So this is exciting. You can, while you're doing the contest, you can connect your logger to a real-time score and watch your, your progress go up or down with respect to people that you are working against. That's a neat thing to do. It's fun. Uh, maybe you're a VHF or UHF -er and you use the internet to tunnel communications from one location to another where you don't have a radio link. You might do this on D-Star or wires or something like that. And there are many, many more things. But the internet and what we're using it for in ham radio are still evolving. And I know when, when we first started using the internet there was a lot of, that's not ham radio, we can't do that, right? But there's a lot of useful things that can be done uh, with the internet and ham radio. Computing power is used for a lot of things. We use it for uh, advanced signal processing. So those of you that have run FT8 know what that's all about. Uh, after you record roughly 45 seconds worth of audio, your computer whirs and grinds on that to go dig into the noise floor and find interesting contacts you can make. Um, that's been used uh, to create Pactor uh, 1, 2, 3, and 4, which are neat modes we can use to send uh, data around. Uh, when I participated uh, with uh, the Salvation Army in the wake of uh, Katrina, I took a Pactor 3 modem with me and a radio and drove around and asked people, have you had a hot meal? And radioed that information back to Salvation Army headquarters quarters and I could send pictures and lengthy reports and everything I wanted using this advanced mode that works over um, HF radio. This is the, the technology that makes direct sampling possible, computing power, and I'll explain that a little bit and show you what that's all about. I'm an engineer after all so I have to use theorem and some technical terms periodically throughout the talk or it just wouldn't be right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and it's also used to decode digital modes. So uh, if you do ready or if you do um, FT8 or WSJT or any of those modes, you use it. So uh, this is an example of a, uh, a rig. Uh, probably everybody in here doesn't have a rig like this. This is a 47 gigahertz rig that's used to uh, win the first EME contact. So this is uh, uh, Al W5LUA's rig and he bounced signals off the moon at 47 gigahertz and worked uh, RW3BP. But the interesting thing about this is this wasn't really possible before the computer because you can't hear your echoes well enough off the moon on 47 gigahertz because it scatters the signals too much. So 
what they chose to do was write some computer software and they sent their CQs and their exchanges multiple times, recorded that, and then used the computer to average all those together and then produce an audio file that sounded like CW because they sent it in CW over and over again and then they used their mind and their ears to decode the CW. Well, the recording and the adding and all that really wasn't possible without the computer. As I mentioned, uh, FT8 uh, is a huge deal in the last year or two, and um, it, it takes computing power to go figure all that out and be able to work FT8. And you can see all the FT8 signals down there in the waterfall, and a lot of people are doing this. I know there's some days that I get on 20 meters, and I think my antenna's broken, except for the fact that there's nothing, 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 and then there's a bunch of FT8 signals, and then there's nothing, nothing, nothing. <laughs> So I want to look at uh, computing power and what's available and what's coming up just to give you a sense for, for how that's going to help us. And then a little later in the talk I'll talk about uh, how the computing power can help us. So uh, you can go out today and buy a BeagleBone Black, which is a little circuit board that has a uh, AM3358 uh, processor made by TI. It has an ARM Cortex-A8 on it, runs at a gigahertz, has one core, and it's 55 bucks. Well, when I got started in computers, uh, my computer was a Commodore PET. It ran at one megahertz instead of a gigahertz. <laughs> and uh, it was a significantly slower thing, and it cost $1,500. So you've all seen what's happened here in the computing world. But just to look at some others here, uh, there's been an add-on to this in the last year or so that has uh, two cores that run at a gigahertz and a half. It's a little more than twice as much. There's the Raspberry Pi 3. B plus, which is just an amazing board. It has a quad-core Cortex-A53 64-bit processor with 1.4 gigahertz CPUs, four of them, and it's 35 bucks. It's just incredible. This is the processor only that we use uh, in the flex radios. It's a TMS320 DM8168. It has a Cortex-A8 and a DSP processor in one part, so it's got two cores and they're about 100 bucks. But you look at some of these other uh, processors that are coming up, there's 8-core uh, and 16-core 64-bit processors that run at 2 gigahertz on one chip. And, you know, they're a couple hundred, three hundred dollars. So those things will continue to come down in price and we'll be able to put more and more horsepower to do neater and neater things in ham radio. In the direct sampling world, which again I'll explain in a minute, we use a thing called an FPGA, which is a field programmable gate array. And there won't be a quiz on this later, but this is an interesting device and they have a lot of power in them. So I want to show you some of these. Uh, this is an Altera EP4CE55, which has 56,000 56, uh, logic slices on it, has 154 multipliers. So that's like 154 CPUs that do multiplication on it. Uh, has 2.3 megabits of BRAM, runs at 200 megahertz, and these are 173 bucks. And I bet a lot of you own one of these. If you own an IC7300, you have one of these parts. This is the part that does the magic in that radio. Xilinx makes a similar part. You can see all the specs there. It has about twice the number of multipliers, twice the number of BRAM, runs at twice the frequency. It's about 700 bucks. And this is what powers a Flex 6400. The next part up here, again, just about doubles the size. It's about 800 bucks, and this is the part that powers the Flex 6600. These parts seem expensive and they seem large, but they're nothing compared to what's available. Uh, we built a radio for the U.S. government that receives uh, 24 satellites at once, and uh, here's the specs on that part, um, and it's $6,400. And uh, here's a part that we're not currently using, and it has, you look at the numbers on it, it's, you know, even larger, and it's $12,000. But, you know, these things, uh, as uh, fancy as they are, they're all just little teeny micro acres of silicon put into a chip package. And what you're paying for here is all the design work that went into them, and the company's monetizing all that. And over time, these parts will be available for 100 bucks, the ones that are $12,000. And so there's all kinds of neat new things we'll be able to do with those when they're available. And you can't blame these manufacturers manufacturers for pulling the margin out of the market now. This is how they design new things and figure out how to do them. So we're lucky to get the ones that we have. Oh, and there's one other one here that, that I forgot about to tell you, but you can look, it's even larger than that, and I couldn't even find a price on it. It's so new, but it's crazy stuff. All right, so let's look at software-defined radio. What can we do with that? 
So there's visualizations that we can do that, that have never been uh, possible before, and one of those is what you can see in the spectrum with uh, pan adapters and waterfalls. Pan adapters let you see the signals in real time, and waterfalls let you see how they looked over time. The old way of doing this was to use a sweep oscillator, and you'd take an oscillator and you'd move it across the band, and you'd measure the signal as you did that, and bullet back to the start, and do that over and over again. And there are some older radios that do this. Um, uh, I used to have an ICOM 756 Pro 3. If you have any of the 756 Pro line, uh, that's how they work. They have an oscillator that sweeps. If you have an old spectrum analyzer, this is how they work. Today we can pull in the whole spectrum at once, process it in an FPGA, and show that spectrum instantaneously in what's called a FFT or Fast Fourier Transform. And that's something that we can do in software-defined radio. We also have much cleaner receivers than we ever had before due to the fact that we've eliminated all the mixers in the analog stages in the radio and turned those all into digital using either direct conversion or direct sampling, something again I'll show you about. But one of the neatest things that we got out of software defined radio was the upgradable radio. So you could buy a radio, take it home, use it, be delighted with what you have, and six months later, the guy that produced that radio could say, I've got all new software, and you can download a new radio. So that's a really fascinating thing that we've been able to do in the hobby. So like I said, I'm an engineer, so I gotta see how many people I can put to sleep by showing some uh, architecture slides. So I'm gonna do that real quick, and then I'll get off of them. So this is the radio of the past, a multi-conversion radio, where you had, you would come in with RF, and you would do several levels of down conversion. And this is a 756, like I said, I had one of these. There were three levels of down conversion, and each one of those, there's distortion. Uh, ICOM introduced the 7600 several years ago, and when they did, they said if you compare it to a typical triple conversion radio, this one's a double conversion, and it drastically reduces signal distortion, which is true. When you get rid of those analog stages, you reduce the distortion. And so now, you know, ICOM has introduced the 7610, which goes to direct sampling and remove, removes all of those. They're now all done digitally. So this is direct conversion. This is one of the first radios we had out, and it goes directly from RF down to uh, baseband and processes there. There's one mixer in this radio, and so it has a little distortion, but not as much as a triple conversion one. And this is a slide just to show you. This was done by a Russian ham, and he shows you in the upper left corner there is a Flex 5000 that has the direct conversion. And the other three slides are what the, the uh, IF looks like in the radio that does the triple conversion. And you can see all kinds of noise and grunge and reciprocal mixing that comes out of that. And this is a slide to show you what it's, what it's like to go reduce those number of stages in the radio. So the, the, the big market leader today is direct sampling, and this is really what's going to be the future of amateur radio. And in direct sampling, you take the entire HF spectrum or whatever spectrum you want to look at, and you turn the whole thing into digital all at once. And then you can place multiple receivers and detectors and spectrum displays and whatever else in the, dis in the digital results of all that. You still have all the same tuning elements and mixers that you'd have in a super heterodyne radio, but they're all in digital math, and there's no errors, and there's no rounding, and there's no component variation or anything like that. So these radios, after the analog to digital stage, are essentially perfect. So this is a slide to kind of match the one you saw from the Russian ham. This is from an uh, A to D converter vendor that's showing you what the spectrum looks like after you've done the sampling. And you can see it's very, very clean. This, this is a two-tone test, so you have the two large tones there. And for the most part, there's nothing else in the spectrum. There's a few small spurs, but it's a very, very clean noise floor. And this is what direct sampling buys you. So there's some tricks to direct sampling, and, and I want to show you what some of those are, and then go look at the technologies that affect this and explain how this will change over time. So I have to use the word theorem again because I'm an engineer. So I'm going to show you the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem, for those of you that don't know it. And the rule is you have to sample at least at twice the frequency you expect to capture in the radio. So if you want your radio to work from 0 to 6 meters, the top end of 6 meters is 54 megahertz. So you have to sample at least at 108 megahertz in order to make the radio work at direct sampling. Signals outside of that zone, if you go above the 108 megahertz, can fold back in and look identical to signals that are below that. And so this is what this looks like. Here's two signals that are at different frequencies. There's one that's at one frequency and one that's one and a half. And you can see if I sampled at these even points, the points there look identical for the two signals. And the result of this is the higher frequency signal shows up in the radio at the lower frequency signal's frequency. And you can't tell them apart. 
so you don't know where that signal actually is. And so what we do to fix this is we put a filter in there called the Nyquist filter that restricts everything to the area of the Nyquist band. So the example I used before, I said if we sample from 0 to 54 megahertz, we put a sharp filter there at 54 megahertz and roll everything off so other signals can't fold back into the spectrum. There, believe me, there's a reason for talking about this. I'll show you in just a second. So here's some common sampling frequencies. Uh, 122 megahertz is used by all those radios I list out there. And the reason that this is used, one of the reasons is because you can go from zero to six megahertz. I can get up to 61 megahertz with this. And so you can build an HF radio that's direct sampling in one Nyquist zone. Uh, if you double that, you can also go all the way up to 122 megahertz. And if you want to, you can put two filters in the radio one that's for the first Nyquist zone and one that's for the second one which goes from 122 to 245 megahertz which would let you listen to VHF. And this is how our Flex 6700 works. And if you want to listen to more and more frequencies higher and higher up you can put additional filters but you got to put a filter for each block of your Nyquist zone. So one filter for the first 122 megahertz, a next one for the next 122 and so on all the way up the line. And so that gets more and more expensive and there's, there's a reasons why you wouldn't want to do that. But this is literally what the schematic of the Flex 6700 looks like. There's a switch there and you have to pick. Do you want 0 to 122? Do you want HF? Or do you want, this is a 140 to 160 megahertz bandpass filter, do you want VHF? And for each antenna you get to pick. Okay, so these filters, uh, we would like them to look like this where they're all brick wall. But that's not how real filters work. They look like this. They have what's called a transition band. So there's an area where they, they're starting to work and then where they fully work and then on the other side there. So why am I telling you all this radio designer engineer stuff? Well, it's because I want you to see how the future radios can change based on ADC sampling technology. So I want to show you some of the analog to digital converters that are used in this new technology, how much they cost and what you can do with them. So the first one here is an AD9874 made by Analog Devices. It samples at 26 megahertz. So the maximum frequency we can see in this is half that, which is 13 megahertz. So it wouldn't be much good. It'd get you everything below 20 meters. Uh, it has 24 bits worth of resolution in it, which is pretty good. And the data that comes out of that converter is 620 megabits a second. That's what you have to process in that microprocessor that we talked about earlier, or the FPGA. And these are 15 bucks. They're pretty cheap. <coughs> the next one is an LTC 2208. It samples, you can go up to 122 megahertz, or maybe a little higher than that. Uh, this puts your Nyquist at 6 meters. You can get 14 bits out of this. The data coming out of it is a gigabit a second. So how many of you have a 100 megabit LAN at home? <laughs> How many of you have a gigabit LAN at home? Okay, this part would fill two of those, right? So it's a lot of data. This is why we have to have the FPGA to process all that data. That part's 55 bucks. If you own an IC7300 or an IC7610, you have one or two of those parts. That's the part used in that radio. This is the analog devices 9467. Uh, we run it at twice that speed so we can go up to VHF. It produces almost four gigabits of data out of it. So again, more data, it's 120 bucks. So is this the state of the art? Is this as far as we can go? So I went and did a little survey and looked at what other parts are available. There's the AD6674 that samples at a gigahertz. So with one converter, one Nyquist you can go up to UHF. So you can receive HF all the way up to UHF in this part it produces 14 gigabits a second worth of data. It fills 14 gigabit lands. It's a huge amount of data. And that part's $600, which is why you don't see it in a lot of ham radios today. It's expensive. They make another part that's better than this that does three gigabits a second. You could go all the way up to 1296 with it with one part. It produces 42 gigabits worth of data and it costs $895. Expensive part. Is that the end? No. So here's the AD9213 announced last week. It goes up to 10.25 gigahertz. So you could digitize HF all the way up to the ham 5.7 gigahertz band, and it produces 123 gigabits of data, and it costs $3,652. We won't be putting one of those in a ham radio anytime soon. But again, like all things semiconductors, these will go down over price, and more and more capability will be possible. So it's very possible that you'd be able to hold a handheld radio with something like this that's a later part that would be able to let you listen from 0 to 5 gigahertz with one part. 
That was the dream when this radio was created, right? <laughs> so this is a, a Heath kit I pulled out of an ad. It's 32 bucks. But look at the size of that thing in this guy's hand. <clears throat> so what do today's handheld radios look like? Very different. So these are all fairly new radios. Uh, the one on the left is a Yaesu. I think it was introduced this year, the year before. The middle one is a transceiver that's built kind of on an Android phone. So it has an IPS touchscreen display. It's beautiful. And the one on the right is just a scanner, but I think it goes up to uh, gigahertz or something like that. And it has a color IPS display as well. So most of you that have a handheld radio probably don't have a touchscreen on your radio yet, but this is where this market's going, right? Everything has touchscreens, color displays, all that kind of stuff. I was watching uh, Westworld on HBO the other day and this guy grabs this handheld that's, you know, it's about this thin and it's shaped about like that middle one and I looked at it and I, I went looking for that thing on the internet and I found this. There's something that really looks like it that's available. Another new technology that's really interesting is that of the radio server. And the radio server is the kind of product that we make which allows you to digitize a lot of spectrum and then make it available to multiple clients. And the radio server has the promise of being able to decode many signals. You could potentially turn sideband speech into text and actually record conversations and turn them into text. And you could search through that stuff later and listen to conversations. There's all kinds of things you could do. So I want to step through now and talk about some of uh, all of these different technologies I've talked about and what they could do for you and what the future of ham radio might be with some of these. So one of the things that's a neat application of all the technology is being able to decode things. So uh, how many of you have either used or seen C or know what it is, CW Skimmer in operation? Yeah, so not very many of you. Well, this program you can run and point at a uh, digital radio uh, that's serving up a whole segment of a band and you can decode simultaneously all of the CW signals at once and watch them. And it can either list out all the call signs, so you could go click on one and work them, or you could record all the data out of this and, and see what's going on. Well, today you can do that on CW and recently RIDI. You can also do the same thing on RIDI and, and PSK. Tomorrow you could potentially record everything digital and potentially even sideband. Uh, the, uh, if you've looked at the technology of uh, speech to text, uh, we've just hit the threshold now with uh, Google Voice where uh, it's 95% accurate. It's a little better than 95% accurate. And actually, humans listening to humans is about 95% accurate. So we've just crossed over it. So how many people today said, huh, to your spouse, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> But so now you could take uh, the, the engines that do that and point them at sideband conversations and while I don't think they'll get 95% right away because as we know sideband is not quite as intelligible as, as our spouses are, um, you could get a lot of data out of it. And so over time we can probably digitize all that. And digital now is fully integrated. You don't have to have cables. You can receive all this in your computer and decode it. So this is an example spectrum display. And you can see, I don't know how well y'all can see, but there's a bunch of digital signals in here. And those of you that work digital modes probably know what these are. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, there's PSK. In the middle, there's Olivia. I know it's Olivia, not because I decoded it, but you can see these, these blips at the start of it. And if you've ever listened to Olivia, it goes dee-doo-dee-doo, and then has all the tones. And then at the end of it, it does the same thing. And you can see those tones in the waterfall. And then to the right of that, there's uh, JT65 and even uh, JT9. So there's no reason that we can't take a radio and simultaneously decode all this all the time and alert you when somebody comes on that you want to work or, or whatever. Another key thing that, that's going to become more prevalent is the ability to do remote. And uh, today, uh, we have the beginnings of really good remote. You can operate your radio remote. Uh, many people have cobbled together all kinds of fancy remote stations where you can tune your rotators and adjust your antennas and turn on your amplifiers and all that. But the future of remote is that you can take a handheld device and operate your complete station, however complicated it happens to be. Turn your rotator, turn your amplifier on, move your antenna to another location. Uh, maybe you just click on a spot and all that stuff happens automatically. Your radio says, oh, I know he's in North Korea and I want my amplifier on because I want to get him the first time and I know what azimuth that is and rotates the tower and tunes the antenna to the right frequency. So in the future you can control anything from anywhere and you can use cell phones, tablets and pretty much any amateur market device to go do that. And you can never miss DX, right? You can get a, a phone call or a text message that says there's something going on and go work that DX. 
Another neat thing you might be able to do in the future with remote is to be able to vote or combine multiple receivers. So if you've ever participated in or run a net on HF, you know that sometimes the net control can't hear everybody because of Skip or where he's located or his particular station. Well imagine if the net control can link together three or four receivers across the country, pull all those into his radio and let it pick whichever one he can hear best so he can hear everyone. And then he could even potentially transmit on more than one frequency and let everybody hear him that way. So there's all kinds of fancy things that could be done there. Uh, you could use multiple receivers to fill in conversations like we do today with diversity or even decode more digital signals. You could have a display that looks like this where the top pan adapter has Portland, Oregon and the bottom uh, pan adapter has Portland, Maine. And you could listen in both places and, and your, your radio would tell you which one you could hear better from. Another neat thing we could do would be to record the world. So if we have direct sampling and we have massive storage, we can record all the HF bands all at once. So one of the things I joke to my colleagues about that I want to do is I want to be able to take a direct sampling receiver, put it on during CQ Worldwide and record the entire contest, CW or phone. And then I want to go to a convention like this and have somebody stroll in the booth that doesn't know what we're doing. And I can say, hey, were you in CQ Worldwide last week? And they say, oh yeah, yeah, I worked it. And I say, well, what mode? I was on sideband. And I type in their call sign and presto, up comes their audio working stations because I've already gone and converted all that into text, I've searched it in my database, and I've advanced to that time index, and I'm playing them working somebody. Wouldn't that be neat to do? <laughs> yeah, right. And then I press a button and rescore their whole contest and tell them where they should be DQ'd because they worked or not. <laughs> <clears throat> But you could play back a whole contest. So if you wanted to get somebody started in contesting, that's a neat way for them to observe what's going on. Uh, like I said, you could decode everything and search for calls. So that'd be a neat thing to do. Uh, we could also take that and put it back into our uh, our uh, pan adapter and our operating our radio so that now we can show you the exact time index and you can move forward and backward in time and listen to things that have happened and all that kind of stuff. Somebody can say, I called you and you say, well, oh yeah, you did call me. Another neat thing we'll be able to do is integrate our shacks. As I mentioned, you could, you could take your, uh, your stepper beam and your amplifier and your rotators and hook all those together. Uh, today, there's a lot of guys that are doing this. Uh, they do this on-premise through automation and all kinds of stuff for contests. Uh, but I think uh, the, the world of tomorrow is that any ham can go do this. It doesn't matter. You can have a modest station with a couple of antennas and maybe you have an amplifier, maybe you don't. You have a rotator and all that stuff can be done uh, easily remotely. You just go buy a couple of things and you're set to go. Another neat new thing that, that could come out in the future is signal classification where uh, you look today and there's virtually none of this. You don't you don't look at the you can look at the band and see what's going on, but there's nothing else that does that. And tomorrow you could go find everything. So you might say, I want to work somebody uh, in Olivia or PSK31 and not know where those signals are, and you could ask your radio and say, what, what band are the most PSK31 signals on? And your radio could go show you, well, they're on this band. You might even be able to search by call sign. Uh, you're, you could find out that your buddy's going to be on the air in the afternoon, but you don't know what band he's on. You know he's hopping around working 20, 40, whatever. You type in his call sign and your radio says, yeah, I heard him on phone over here, and, but now he's on CW over on this band. Uh, steering in MIMO is another unique, unique application which is happening in the cell phone industry, which we could bring here. Uh, a lot of guys now are using phased arrays for uh, 160, 80, even 40 meters where they can take a series of antennas and change phasing harnesses on them and change the directionality of that antenna. Uh, you have like four antennas in a row, four square, and you can go do that. Most of the guys that are doing that today are using it with fixed phasing harnesses where they have a box and it switches in coax and that sort of thing. There's a few guys that are doing it with software-defined radio, but the future is that you could do this on any band with any mode and if you had multiple transmitters you could do the same thing on transmit where you ran a transmitter to each one of these antennas and you could shape your antenna pattern by changing the phase of each of those antennas. So neat things you could do there. Pan adapters and waterfalls are really neat, but there's all kinds of new visualizations we could have too. Uh, the one on the right here is a, a spectrum analyzer that incorporates a time function in it. So a signal that's sweeping through the band has some persistence so you can see where it's moved before. Uh, how many people have been on HF and heard whoop? 
because there's an ionosonder that's rolled through the band. Well, if you have a waterfall, you can actually see that thing work up the band and it's going, it's going, it's going. Then it turns off suddenly because there's a frequency it's not allowed to transmit on. Then a little up the band, it comes back on again. Well, you could be able to see those things in your pan adapter as well and see where they persisted. I know on the if you have a uh, waterfall and a pan adapter on HF, you can see now there's a lot of guys that are doing frequency hopping. I don't even know who they are, but they'll they'll transmit about a uh, 10 kilohertz wide swath of digital data for a second or two and it'll move around on the band. You can see those kind of things. But we'll be able to have new visualizations that'll let you get new insights into what's going on the band and decide where you want to work people. Noise reduction. I know nobody in here is probably plagued with noise, right? We don't have any noise on HF at all. Uh, we have techniques today. We have noise blankers, noise reduction, all kinds of things. But the world of tomorrow is we'll be able to have dedicated noise receivers that listen to local noise and actually subtract that out of what we're listening to. And there's all kinds of new noise mitigation techniques that we could have. Networking. Uh, today we do the occasional remote to base kind of operation, uh, but tomorrow we'll be able to combine remote assets in a single program to do all kinds of different stuff, as I've mentioned before. You could do neat, neat applications with this. You might be able to do, uh, let's say, uh, ionospheric mapping. So I might be able to say, I want to use all of your radios to send a very low power signal up to the ionosphere, get a reflection back, collate all that data, and actually plot out what the ionosphere looks like over the United States, and then predict which bands are going to work for which people connecting point to point. And you might be able to go into your radio and say, I want to work W5XYZ, and it would say, the optimum band for that today is whatever band, 10 meters or 20 meters or 40 meters or whatever. So today we do some of this, right? We have reverse beacon networks which go uh, look for other signals and provide us some of this kind of information, but it's not very detailed. And we could be able to see a lot more data with this over time. You could actually go enter the country that you need and say what bands are best to go work that country on. Or you could set up your radio to alert you and say, you know what, the conditions are perfect now to go work whatever country you need. The other neat new thing in ham radios is uh, less wires. So those of you that have ever set up a station are probably familiar with the back side of the radios and what they look like and you accidentally trip over one of these and the whole thing doesn't work and you got to go climb behind there and make everything work. Well this is going away. There's more and more uh, integration in the technology and so the back of your station can look cleaner and cleaner as time goes on. There's even some out of this world applications that are being worked on. Uh, for example, geosynchronous direct sampling multi-channel satellites. So there's a program called uh, Phase 4 that's working on producing a multi-channel satellite that could be accessed by any amateur. The bandwidth would be dynamically allocatable. So you could say, I want just enough conversation for a voice, or just enough spectrum for a voice or for a text message. Or you could say, I want to transmit a big file. Maybe you're in a hurricane area and you want to transmit a picture of the boats and the trees to convey the sense of what's going on. Uh, so that's a neat new project that's going on. So in summary, I really do feel like it's an exciting time to be a ham. There's a lot of neat new technologies that are going on and uh, that are going to continue to create um, exciting prospects for the future. Uh, there's exciting pro projects and companies that are building new, new things in a continual stream of stuff. This is a quote from Neil deGrasse Tyson. He said, it's the inspired student that continues to learn on their own. That's what separates the real achievers in the world from those who pedal along finishing assignments. And uh, I want to encourage all of you uh, to be an Elmer and inspire someone. This is what's going to continue to bring people into our hobby and make this a great hobby moving forward. The person that you happen to Elmer might be the next guy that creates the new technology for ham radio that really rejuvenates the hobby. And support those who are advancing the technology. So if you know people that are working on side projects that are neat technologies that might be incorporated into ham, ham radio, help those people out and do what you can. And be inclusive and do everything you can to bring in people who, no matter whether or not they understand everything, uh, can play a part in the hobby. So thank you all. It's been a great honor to be your speaker tonight in uh, 73s. Thank you very much. And when we leave, we take the future right along with us, don't we? Some of us have been in the hobby for a while. A uh, 14-year-old kid, I uh, was skiing 6 VGL, went to a ham club. They looked, they looked at me and didn't see me. They just looked right on through. That's happening less today. We see young people walk in the door, and we include them.
Because we understand that that's where the future is. And they aren't going to get started without our passion and our involvement in t bringing them along in, the, in this hobby. It's a different day. Completely different day. Back when I started out, it was, who were those guys with all that Mickey Mouse Donald Duck sound on the, on the radio? That's not radio. Nobody in their right mind would operate in that mode. And of course, you know where it's gone today. Now, the folks who were saying that, or at least their, their descendants, are now discovering AM. But uh, that's what was the, the in thing back then. The hobby continues to change. And you and I are the ones who bear that, that hobby in the future. Steve, we appreciate your time, your energy, and your work uh, in the industry as well. We appreciate it a lot.